Okay, are we ready to start everyone? Good to go when you are, Mike. Welcome everyone to the 57th ADM of the World to Wildlife Trust Limited. My name is Mike Hodgkins, Chair of the Trustees. Normally, the ADM is chaired by the Trust's President, However, we are presently without a president and have been unable to select a candidate during the past year to be nominated for and elected to that position, hopefully to be rectified over the coming year. Because of the need to protect ourselves during the current pandemic, the trustees agreed that we must hold this year's AGM virtually. We had planned to include the AGM as part of our annual Country Comes to Town event. Several years we held this in the marketplace in Devizes. And then last year we held it in Salisbury to show support for the city following the horrible incident with Novichok. This year we were due to be at Lydiard Park in Swindon. Holding the AGM in this virtual fashion is a first for the Trust. The Charity Commission has provided advice for trustees to ensure that the AGM is valid. The government introduced emergency COVID legislation that ensures that AGMs held in this way are fully legal. So we are holding the AGM via Zoom and streaming this live via YouTube. On Zoom, filling our screen, we have trustees and committee members together with senior staff. Some of them will be speaking later in response to questions. To remind everyone, you should have received in your member's mailing notice of the AGM, which included information about how to join us today, AGM agenda, minutes of last year's AGM, annual review, voting slip, and space for any questions to be returned to the Trust. I can confirm that not only are we core rate, but more people have participated in voting in this year's AGM than can normally attend in person. Thank you to everyone who has responded. So let me return to the agenda. Item two, the adoption of the minutes of the 56th annual general meeting held on the 21st of September, 2019. This has been proposed by Roe Collingbourne and seconded by Matt Jolly. Louise Hale is our company secretary and received all the voting slips that were delivered by the stated deadline. Hello, everyone. 
Thank you, Lou. I can declare that the votes received were 194, 11 abstain, and none against. I can confirm that the minutes are adopted. Item three on our agenda is matters arising. None were identified. So I can move on to the presentation of annual reports and accounts. I would like to thank the staff for producing such an excellent annual review, despite all the difficulties presented by the coronavirus pandemic, when many staff were furloughed and others were adapting to the challenges of working from home. I hope you all agree. As I said in the foreword to the annual review, despite the pandemic, the Trust has achieved an incredible amount. Once again, I want to thank our staff for their excellence in delivery, our army of dedicated volunteers for everything they do, you, our members, for providing the day-to-day -day financial resources for the Trust to invest in Wiltshire's wildlife and people. At today's AGM, James Ravine steps down as trustee, having served for six years. He sat on both the personnel and finance committees and also supported the work of the fundraising and communications staff. I'm delighted to say that we won't be losing James's skills and experience as he has agreed to continue to serve on our committees. Morris Avent stood down as a trustee a few months ago following a bereavement. I want to thank Morris for his six years as a trustee and for chairing the Trust's Conservation Committee. Again, I'm delighted that Morris hopes to continue his involvement with the Trust. His charm, knowledge and expertise has been a great benefit to us. It is also my last AGM as a trustee. For the past six years, I have been privileged to serve as chair of trustees. It has been truly rewarding to be part of the Trust over this period. There have been considerable challenges every year, but the Trust also has an enviable record of success every year. When I look back over this relatively short time, it is amazing to see what the Trust has achieved. Now I must touch on the Trust's finances. You will all have seen the figures in the annual review. This first slide shows our income, £4,236,423, which is broadly similar to last year. The next slide shows what we spent the money on, again, broadly similar to last year. This summary of the balance sheet shows the Trust to be in a strong financial position. We must always continue fundraising for the financial resources to enable us to continue the great work we are doing, and we must not rest on our laurels. The investments we have made in previous years in farming infrastructure, buildings and equipment, and the great team of staff and volunteers we now have, have meant that we have coped well with the many challenges resulting from the pandemic. Trust has taken advantage of various government support schemes for businesses and the voluntary sector, such as the furlough scheme and COVID emergency grants from the lottery. The strength of our relationship with companies such as Hills has been important. They have stuck with us through these challenging times. When the pandemic struck, I was concerned that we might see a rapid loss of members but it has been so encouraging to see our members sticking with us. Thank you. Perhaps one reason is that during lockdown, nature became even more important in people's lives. Since July, we have started recruiting new members again. A frequent comment is that people would like to give something back, having benefited so much from nature during lockdown. One of the great strengths of the Trust has been the balance struck between creating living landscapes across Wiltshire and Swindon and helping people to engage with nature and live sustainably. Our nature reserves are simply breathtaking in their beauty and tranquility, and some of the very best meadows, woods, lakes, rivers and downland in the whole of the UK. They are home to many rare and endangered species, form biodiversity hotspots from which nature can spread as we work towards nature's recovery. 
Over the last few years, we have significantly added to the number and area of nature reserves. Fire in the meadows at Mordingside Farm, doubling the size of Coombe Bissett Down, purchasing the woods at Semley, and setting up nature parks at Adpole Farm in Swindon and next to Green Lane and Biss Woods in Trowbridge. We have set up from scratch Lakeside Care Farm at Lower Moor Farm. It is a huge success. Last year, working with 111 students, of whom 21 have grown in such confidence they have been able to rejoin mainstream, mainstream schooling. Spurred on by its great success, we are currently building the Willows Care Farm at Broughton Gifford, where we were recently gifted 70 acres of organic farmland stable block and paddock, the latter being where the care farm will be made. We have greatly extended and developed the Brockbank Centre at Langford Lakes and set up Kingfisher Cafe. It is well named and visitors have had some very special views of Kingfisher. We are currently making the reserve even better for birds by creating a whole new extensive area of ponds and scrapes. The, the reserve attracts a wonderful variety of birds, including some rare Schedule 1 species like little ringed plover. We are making new islands on the existing pond, hopefully benefiting species such as lapwing. Similarly, at Lower Moor Farm, we have built a new nature centre, including a cafe on the shore of Cottage Lake. This year, our newly installed tern rafts were home to some breeding common terns. And from the cafe veranda, you might just have an otter pop up and see you. And just like at Langford, we are planning to create a significant new area of wetland for overwintering and migrating birds. There are so many astonishing projects I could tell you about, like the work we are about to start helping unaccompanied asylum-seeking children settle better by engaging them in Wiltshire's natural environment. What we do in this county is often groundbreaking and extends much further. A good example is action for insects. The rapid decline in insect biomass and diversity was considered by trustees to be a key issue that we should get involved in reminding us of concerns at the forefront of people's minds when the trust was set up in 1962 and the publication of Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. We shared our concerns with colleagues in the other wildlife trusts in the Southwest, and together we commissioned a report from national expert, Professor Dave Goulson, which attracted lots of media interest. The Action for Insects campaign that is what it is, a campaign to reverse the declines in insects and restore the health of ecosystems. It's now a core part of the work of the whole Wildlife Trust movement. Nationally, RSWT, the Royal Society of Wildlife Trusts, has a new CEO, who from what I've seen is going to help take the movement forward, and help ensure it becomes a much greater force for nature. Finally, in Gary, we have a CEO with considerable experience and dedication who has lost none of his energy, passion and vision. He has provided great leadership to the Trust throughout this time and will continue to guide the Trust through these interesting and extraordinary times that are proven to be full of opportunity as well as challenge. Thank you. I now come to item five on our agenda. The adoption of the annual report and account. This has been proposed by our treasurer, Peter Luck, and seconded by fellow trustee, Denise Plummer. I can declare that the votes received were 197 for, four abstain, and none against. So I can confirm that the annual report and accounts are adopted. <coughs> I now come to item six of the agenda, appointment of Monaghan's as auditors and authorization of the trustees to fix their remuneration. This has been proposed by Peter Luck and seconded by Mark Street. 
I can declare that the votes received were 192 for, six abstain, and three against. So I can confirm that Monaghan's are duly appointed and their remuneration will be fixed by the trustees. I now turn to the election of new trustees. Firstly, Mark Street. Mark has served as vice chair and is a member of the Land Management Committee and recently took on the chairing of the Conservation Committee. I can declare that the votes received were 196 for, three abstain and two against. So I can confirm that Mark has been duly re-elected to serve a further three years. Martin Allais is a member of our personnel committee and is standing for his first three-year term of office. Martin's election is proposed by Roe Collingbourne and seconded by Matt John. I can declare that the votes received were 187 for, 10 abstain and 4 against. So I can confirm that Martin has been duly elected. Lastly, Charlie Fatterini. Charlie is a member of the Land Management Committee and is currently leading a comprehensive review of all our nature reserves commissioned by Gary. What an excellent excuse to visit every single one of our reserves. His election is proposed by Mark Street and seconded by Matt Jolly. I can declare that the votes received were 187 for, 12 abstain, and two against. So I can confirm that Charlie is also duly elected. I come to any other business. There was none notified in advance, but we did invite members to submit questions. And we've had some excellent questions. The first is from a member who asks, can we alert our members to the scourge of hair coursing, reminding members to report suspicious activity to the police? And if safe to do so, noting details, including vehicle registration numbers. You are right to raise this issue, but it seems to be getting worse. I understand that much of this is due to organised crime syndicates and illegal betting. Please do report anything suspicious, but please stay safe. We have a question from a member who says, I visit Blankford Lakes quite often. Would it be possible to charge to go into the reserve? It would bring in extra income and help stop the abuse in some of the hides from some of the general public who visit there but have no genuine interest in the wildlife there. Can I turn to Damien Hashes, Head of Business Development and Community Engagement, to respond? Hi, everybody. Um, yes, that's a good question, and we have thought about charging, but our nature reserves, like Langford Lakes, that have been purchased with grants from bodies such as the National Lottery, specify that we need to provide free access. We do invite donations from visitors to help support the maintenance of sites. On the point of antisocial behaviour, sadly, we are not immune, but fortunately, the amount suffered by the trust is much lower than most other wildlife trusts. That's not to say that it's acceptable. The long-term answer is perhaps summarised best by Sir David Attenborough, who said, no one will protect what they don't care about, and no one will care about what they have never experienced. And that's why our work to reconnect people to nature is so important. Amen. The next question asks, what can we do to persuade local authorities to stop destroying valuable insect habitat along road verges? If I turn to Dougald McNaughton, Head of Fundraising and Comms, to write an answer. Thank you, Mike, and hello everyone, uh, particularly to those who are watching on YouTube this morning or this afternoon. As part of the Actions for Insects campaign that Mike mentioned earlier, we are encouraging people to ask their local authorities questions about the steps that they're taking. This could be through, for example, raising a question at a local council meeting, uh, which asks why they are cutting verges unnecessarily. Um, it could be asking them how they intend to reduce their use of pesticides. 
Um, it could be through conducting a local letter writing campaign. Uh, it could be through booking an appointment for a constituency <coughs> surgery with individual councillors. There are good examples of how local authorities do manage road verges to benefit wildlife in the information pack that you can download from our website. Can I also say that if it helps, it helps if individuals highlight actions they are taking to help insects, uh, for example, sharing these uh, to others through your social media profiles. Thank you, Dougald. We have a question from a member who asks, why were there no females standing for election as trustees? Now, perhaps I can answer that. This is a good question. When the trust advertises staff roles, there is always a good response from women and men. And the majority of our employees are women, including two out of the four senior managers who report to Gary. The trust prefers that candidates for trustee positions could serve initially on one of our subcommittees. However, responses when we advertise for new committee members predominantly come from men. This experience is not unique for us. In the last year, we have reviewed our advertising to see if we could broaden its appeal. For example, by emphasizing that we welcome interest from people whose work experience could support the health, well-being and education aims of the trust. This may be having a positive effect. Looking ahead, two women will join subcommittees this autumn and two others are considering the possibility with other expressions of interest to still be followed up. I hope this will result in more female trustees in the future. We have a question about Morningside Farm. A wonderful new nature reserve, but how will we balance the needs of wildlife with so many people walking their dogs there, often not on a lead? I'd like to turn to Sam Storr, Head of Conservation, to provide an answer. Thank you, Mike. Hello, everyone. Visitors have been walking with dogs off leads at Morningside for many years before the Trust took the site on. We knew this from the start and we never anticipated that we would be able to achieve a rapid change in this behaviour at this reserve. But there are three things that we are doing to try to address this. So firstly, when we have staff on site, we're approaching visitors as much as social distancing allows at the moment and asking them to keep their dogs on the lead and explaining the reasons behind this. Secondly, we are currently reviewing our signage across all of our sites. Our aim is to design clear and consistent signage that not only requests visitors to keep dogs on leads, but again, explains the reason behind our requests. And thirdly, when you're on Morningside, there is a field to the left of the stream if you look downstream that is currently not connected to a circular walking route. We are going to fence this section and not allow public access in this field in order to provide a refuge for ground nesting birds. Thank you Sam. Another member asks what steps are the trust taking to cope with the loss of EU funding? Gary please could you answer this one? Yes, thank you, Mike, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, well, we've been benefiting from EU funding in a number of ways. Uh, the nature centres and the cafes that you showed the pictures of, Mike, uh, at Langford and Lowermore Farm were both largely funded by an EU grant. But like most grants, we know that the funding for this would be short lived. And so we just simply made the most of it while we could. Similarly, the Building Bridges programme has been funded in part by the EU, and this programme supports people looking to get back into work. So I guess the government uh, would say that the new Kickstarter scheme aimed at 16 to 24 year olds and the increased funding for trainees and apprenticeships will help fill the gap when the EU grant ceases. And I have to say I'm hoping the Chancellor will announce further job creation schemes as Wildlife Trust, we're pushing for a, a national nature service, which I know the government is considering at the moment, which should be offering job opportunities for the young, uh, upskilling anyone actually who's facing unemployment. We've also benefited from EU funding of our agro-environment schemes. 
This is the money that's paid to farmers and, and landowners. And we are already seeing a reduction in basic farm payments and countryside stewardship schemes. Uh, but it is due to be replaced by a new environmental land management scheme. Uh, the details of that scheme have yet to be fully worked out. But if it's on the basis of public money paying for public goods, then I'm hopeful that the trust will be in a position to benefit possibly more than we have done so previously. Thank you, Gary. And a final couple of questions about farming. First comes from a member who says that the red tractor certificate doesn't go far enough. Shouldn't we be organic? And the second asks about the role of livestock in contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. Once again, Gary, could you respond to these questions too? Okay, uh, thanks, Mike, for uh, some <laughs> nice controversial questions to uh, to to end on. Okay, well, the, the trust is very keen on organic principles, and indeed, most of our farming operations would qualify for organic status. The reason uh, we haven't registered as organic is really just a practical one, in that our livestock actually may be lent out to provide grazing on other people's land. This is often part of a non-organic farm, where our grazing helps to achieve an important conservation objective. The farm you know, may have no livestock of their own, and actually it's important that we achieve some grazing there using our own livestock. Without it, the grassland might well deteriorate. But on our own land, we do stick to organic principles. So, I mean, members may be interested to know that David Wilson, the manager of uh, Dutchy Home Farm up by Ho Highgrove, is one of our advisors on the Trust's Land Management Committee. On the second part of the question, um, well, yes, livestock, particularly cattle, do emit methane. It's a short-lived greenhouse gas. Um, there is evidence to show that cattle grazing extensively and not fed on concentrates emit far less methane. But you know, there's no getting away from the fact that uh, livestock do contribute to greenhouse gases. And, and that's why the UK Committee on Climate Change does encourage people to eat less meat. But our view on this, though, is that that is too sweeping a statement and not all meat is the same. So we, wouldn't, we would not encourage people to eat intensively reared animals and maybe eat less, but the trust's livestock is essential to protect, to maintain and to enhance the wildlife rich grasslands that this county is internationally famous for. And while our grazing animals may emit some greenhouse gases, they also help us to capture and to store a great deal of carbon locked up in mostly in the soil of our meadows and downland. Well, I mean, you know, these are you know, complex subjects, but hopefully I've summarized some of the key points. Thank you, Gary. And to everyone who submitted a question, thank you also to all those who answered. Some members didn't want to ask a question at the AGM, but did ask us about some specific issues. As promised, we will be replying to you directly. At our normal AGM, the formal proceedings will be followed by our annual volunteer awards. However, this will now take place at the Country Comes to Town event which we plan to hold at Lydiard Park, Swindon, next spring. Instead, I would like to close this AGM by showing a short video of some of the work that has been undertaken this year. Like the annual review itself, I think it remarkable under the present circumstances that the Trust has managed to prepare this for us.
past year, across many of Wiltshire Wildlife Trust's nature reserves and nature-based programmes, many exciting projects have been carried out. At Coombe Sit Down, the reversion of the arable field back to downland continues, and work has been completed on a new livestock barn, as well as new signage, the installation of a composting toilet, and a butterfly bag. Despite the unpredictable weather, our grassland nature reserves have all been grazed and hay cut to ensure that flowers, insects, birds, and a host of other wildlife continue to flourish, as well as the cattle and animals that we rear there. Throughout the last year, our reserves have been an important sanctuary for people as well as wildlife, offering safe wild spaces to explore during lockdown and people have been watching and recording the amazing wildlife that live on our reserves, from dragonflies, otters, adders and toads, to water voles, kestrels, rabbits and hares. At Langford Lakes, we opened our first cafe and exhibition space in the newly renovated Kingfisher Cafe at the Brockbank Centre. It's been really busy last year for the horse team in the autumn. We completed about 2.7 kilometres of river restoration. We have our flagship project in Gateway Crossing, so up on MOP land near Nether Raven. There we um, entered about 2,500 metres of habitat restoration, as well as introducing about 1,200 tonnes of gravel into the river that's uh, raised bed level and um, improved habitat quality. <laughs> Justin Thimbleby, I'm the Sustainability Officer at Wiltshire Wildlife Trust. This is a new project that started in October last year to build on some of the work the Waste Education team was doing and to broaden that out to taking wider issues around carbon reduction. So I've been staying involved in conversations locally um, about how Wiltshire can reduce carbon emissions. Earlier this year we ran the Waste Free February campaign and had over 300 people take part and reduce their rubbish by over four tonnes. Our Hedgehog Hero campaign was created in an effort to learn more about the health of the hedgehog population in Wiltshire. The response was fantastic, 2,456 people joining the campaign, sending regular sightings and information. In the last year, Lakeside Care Farm has worked with 111 students, engaging them in everything from boat herding to growing prize-winning vegetables and creating wild arts. 21 of these students who previously didn't attend school have grown in such confidence and ability that they are now able to move on to new school placements. Over the last year, Milestones has engaged over 250 vulnerable and marginalised young people with positive outdoor nature-based activities. Along with improving their well-being, these young people have learned how to care for the natural environment that have had a beneficial impact on over 12 community participating, including ongoing work at HFT in Wales, a spire house in Melksham, and eight of our nature reserves. Our wellbeing programme aims to improve participants' mental wellbeing through nature-based activities. In Wiltshire, we piloted a new 12-week programme for adults and in Swindon, three weekly groups running for 35 to 40 participants each week. Our allotment project has also continued to offer further support for people moving on from the groups. Through working with the Trust's Adult Wellbeing Programme, 65% of participants felt more confident and over 80% felt less isolated. Moving Bridges supports clients first from work, so we took the decision to run our programme online during lockdown. We have kept the clients engaged by carrying out three activities a week, a soft skill, a conservation task, and a fun activity. We are one of 19 partners in the Building Bridges program who were nominated and were joint winners in the Integral Team of the Year category in the National ERC and Rehabilitation Awards 2020. Hi everyone, we're at the Bible Society in Swindon, uh, which is where Wild Landscapes, uh, which Wildlife Trust have been, uh, well, spent the last six to nine months creating a orchard for staff to enjoy uh, and benefit wildlife. So we've got a, a variety of apples, pears and plums, which you can see all staked up and planted here. Um, and we've put in some bench seating for staff to enjoy uh, the area on their breaks and lunches. 
Looking back at just some of Wiltshire Wildlife Trust's many achievements of the past year across our reserves and wellbeing projects, it shows that it is possible to shape our county into a healthier, wilder place where nature thrives and enriches the lives of all of us. And that together, it is possible to build a better, more sustainable future for wildlife and people in nature. That is a wonderfully uplifting note to end this AGM. May I finish by thanking everyone involved in making this first ever virtual AGM run smoothly. And of course, my thanks to my fellow trustees, volunteers and staff, and of course to you, our wonderfully supportive members. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>